Hello, and welcome to this virtual event on concrete conservation. First, some announcements. This event is being recorded and will be available on GCI's YouTube channel next week. Throughout the event, you can submit your questions via the Q&A feature. Presenters will respond to the questions live at the end of the event. My name is Ana Paula Arato Gonçalves. I am a research associate at the Getty Conservation Institute and one of the authors of Conservation Principles for Concrete of Cultural Significance. The principles we describe in this document are meant to provide guidance for professionals in the decision-making process involved in the conservation of culturally significant concrete. In this document, we recognize that concrete conservation is still a nascent field, but that good results can be achieved when combining current best practices in general repair of concrete and cultural conservation. Now, I'd like to introduce our speakers. We are very excited to have with us today a great group of professionals from different disciplines to discuss the conservation of concrete. The case studies that our speakers are presenting today illustrate how the process we described in the conservation principles have been adopted in practice. Barnabas Calder is a historian and senior lecturer at the University of Liverpool School of Architecture in the UK and author of Rock Concrete, The Beauty of Brutalism. Susan MacDonald is a conservation architect and head of the Buildings and Sites Department at the Getty Conservation Institute in Los Angeles. She is co-author of Conservation Principles for Concrete of Cultural Significance. Claudia DeVoe is a heritage architect and partner at DeVoe and DeVoe Architects in Paris. She will talk about conserving concrete at Villa E1027 by Eileen Gray and Jean Badovici. Paul Godet is an engineer and principal at Wisjenny Elsner Associates in Chicago. He is presenting the conservation work at North Shore Congregation Israel by Minoru Yamasaki. Rosa Lowinger is a conservator and she is CEO and Chief Conservator of RLA Conservation of Art and Architecture with locations in Miami and Los Angeles. She is presenting the concrete conservation at Miami Marine Stadium by Hilario Candela. Our first presenter is Barnabas. Thank you so much for your invitation to deliver a paean, a hymn of praise to concrete. I'm very happy to do so. I borrowed my title, in fact, from Adrian Forti's review of my last book. I'm also delighted to speak at a celebration of such an important initiative as Getty Conservation Institute's Conservation Principles for Concrete of Cultural Significance, which embodies vital lessons from their wonderful Keeping It Modern Restoration funding program, you'll see some fantastically encouraging and impressive case studies from it today. First slide, please. Reinforced concrete was the great material of the 20th century. Freeing Auguste Perret in France to perfect Gothic architecture with the slimmest possible piers and the most richly glazed walls. Next. Concrete allowed Giovanni Michelucci in Italy to hang his suspended concrete roof like a vast piece of cloth from a cluster of highly expressive and personal concrete tent poles. Next. Concrete freed Paul Rudolph in Massachusetts to create his own fantasy world of exaggerated rough and smooth. Next. Of ventilation shafts turned to more than Michelangelo's sublimity and of staircases. Next whose outrageous, melting, sloppy curvaceousness would have made Bernini or Neumann say, don't you think that's a bit much? Incidentally, this building is under severe and imminent threat. Its loss would be a disaster for modernist heritage. Next. With the governments of much of the world in the 20th century producing a new quantity and quality of infrastructure for educating, housing, and improving the health of their ordinary citizens, reinforced concrete was perfect. 
It could be built fairly fast and fairly cheaply and could allow space efficient high density as on this housing estate in Sheffield, England, or this next one in New York, or this in London. For these sorts of projects, concrete was perfect. Next, please. Monumental and stone-like, celebrating the accession of the ordinary people to a quality and robustness of architecture that had been reserved for the elite in earlier centuries. Exposed concrete was honest in its simple clarity about what a building is made of and how it stands up. It was also inexpensive looking, not providing marble for some at the disgruntled expense of onlooking taxpayers. Perhaps its most important appeal to government clients was the promise that it was maintenance free, that once it was built, it would never need painting or repointing or the replacement of any other sacrificial surface. And the notion of a maintenance free material challenged by this next slide is where many of you come in. Of course, it's not true that concrete is not reparable, but in its need for repair, it returns to its real roots. Next. Concrete was the great material of the machine age, celebrated by its designers and hated by its detractors for its mechanistic, repetitive industrial quality. Yet the reality has always been more complex, more messy, more craft oriented, and so is its repair. Next. This is Hermit's Castle, a beautiful concrete hut self-built on the most remote coast of Scotland by a young architect in 1955. This next photo shows how appealingly sloppy and irregular concrete is when given half a chance. The cement and sand squelching through any gap in the wooden formwork molds into which it was poured, gravel and air pockets giving a highly textured irregularity to the material. Next. Even when an architect like Erno Goldfinger worked with concrete, bringing to it the perfectionism of his teacher Perret, it is a conscious and effortful battle to force the material into orderly and predictable behavior. The tender documents for this building, Trellick Tower, include 41 pages of tightly typed, highly detailed specifications on all aspects of technical and aesthetic handling of concrete commanding, for example, that all the aggregate for the entire project be bought before construction began and mixed together to ensure there wouldn't be any color changes as the structure rose. Next. Nor was Goldfinger's meticulousness confined to paper. At the base of Trellick Tower is a little noticed service area where you can see Goldfinger's design putting the contractors through their paces before they get started on the tower itself. There's a bit of everything here to test their different textures of hammered concrete, a flat headed bush hammer for the parapet, a pointed pick hammer for the rougher main wall surface. Wooden board marked concrete is tested out on the backmost wall you can see here. This challenging area also tries out their ability to cast out around narrow slits, to cast on an angle and to produce attractive curved surfaces. By the time they'd managed this, he could know that they could handle the difficult material to the high technical and aesthetic standard he required. And just as concrete's production required expertise, care and commitment, so does its repair, as you'll see from today's case studies. The Getty Conservation Institute's wonderful document sets out procedures which require patience, experimentation, specialist knowledge and sincere desire to get it right to bring exposed concrete buildings up to good standards of environmental performance whilst retaining their aesthetic qualities is even harder and even more important. To overcome these immense challenges requires buy-in from building managements and funding bodies, contractors and architects. Concrete can be a difficult material to get this positive consensus about. We rightly demonize the use of concrete in new construction projects as an environmental crime. And much of the public still dislikes old concrete because they see it as ugly and lacking in tradition and history, though it was ubiquitous before the birth of most people now alive. Yet 20th century architecture, 
the greatest flowering of architectural activity the world has ever seen was defined and shaped by the outstanding technical properties and overwhelming aesthetic strength of this wonderful material. We must protect and conserve not only the handful of world famous schemes, but the tens of thousands of other first rate buildings from the period, which make up such an important part of the world's best architectural heritage and which collectively represent an enormous stock of embodied energy we cannot afford to lose. This document marks an important step in extending good quality concrete conservation around the world. Last slide, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barnabas. And our next speaker is Susan McDonald. Hello, my name is Susan McDonald and I'm the head of the Buildings and Sites Department at the Getty Conservation Institute. I'm very pleased to be sharing with you our conservation principles for concrete of cultural significance today. Next, please. Concrete is one of the most widely used materials of the 20th century. Its material, structural and architectural development has produced a remarkably rich and um, diverse legacy of buildings and structures from different eras of concrete's development and with an astonishing array of characteristics and qualities. Concrete structures are now increasingly recognized as culturally significant and thus comes the need to conserve them in a way that preserves that significance. Next. To address the well-documented challenges to conserving historic concrete, the GCI have developed conservation principles for concrete of cultural significance. The purpose of this document is to assist in developing a consistent approach to concrete conservation and ultimately to improve standards. Next. The aim of the principles is to provide a framework for making good decisions about conserving important concrete by referencing typical international conservation approaches combined with best practice concrete repair standards in order to secure successful concrete conservation outcomes. Next. The principles outlined in this document provide a logical step-by-step -step approach to concrete conservation. It essentially mirrors the well-established contemporary conservation approach, but applies it to the specific steps of a typical concrete repair project. The document includes the flowchart that's shown here, which has been developed to help you step through a set of principles that can lead to successful conservation. Let me run through these very briefly now. Next. Careful project planning provides the basis for, successful, for any successful project and is the first principle. This stage includes identifying a suitably skilled team, which is fundamental. Concrete conservation is a specialised and a multidisciplinary activity and demands that appropriate technical expertise and experience across all the different stages of the project. It's difficult to achieve good conservation and concrete repair from a team with limited experience. The project goals should be defined at the outset, aiming for best conservation practice balanced with all the usual user needs, available resources, future access and maintenance needs, and considering the sustainability of the work. It's also important to identify all the stakeholders that will influence the results and to consider the regulatory requirements as part of the planning stage. Next. <clears throat> Consistent with all conservation projects is the need to fully understand the building and its conservation needs, and this is the second principle. Assessing and clearly identifying the, the, the significance of the building is a really crucial step, and identifying the character defining features and how, con and how concrete contributes to those. Is the material character of the concrete important? For example, at Bertold Lebetkin's 1934 uh, London Penguin Pool, the thinness of the, cultural, of, of the sculptural ramp is of great significance and needs to be preserved. At the National Theatre Building, also in London, designed by Dennis Lasden and completed in the mid 70s, the raw board marked concrete has been identified as core to the building's significance and cons conservation efforts are directed to preserve it. Historic research, including oral histories, are important for establishing significance. And when we're dealing with buildings from the more recent past, we have the opportunity to talk to architects, engineers, and those involved in the, in the construction of the buildings. 
Next comes the need to evaluate the structure from a material point of view to understand its material characteristics and its condition through site-based and scientific investigation in order to correctly diagnose the problems and of course their causes. It's also important at this stage to gather all the other information that can inform repair, for example, the user needs, regulatory constraints and access and maintenance considerations. Synthesizing and evaluating the results enables a conservation strategy to begin to be developed. Next. The next important principle is to develop a conservation strategy for the repair. And this starts with identifying specific conservation criteria such as taking a minimal approach to cleaning if, um, if the patina was important, preserving the original surface finish as color and texture or whatever has been identified as being important. Trials, mock-ups and testing of the repair approaches should be undertaken to determine the appropriateness, the efficacy and the performance of any of the proposed treatment. Trials and mock-ups are crucial and need to be factored into the project from the outset. The results that can, be, can then be evaluated and the concrete repair strategy or project can then be developed in detail. Next. <clears throat> Implementation of successful concrete repair demands a selection of suitably qualified and skilled contractors. Low quality concrete repair will inevitably lead to rework, unnecessary future costs, can potentially accelerate decay and can result in removing additional historic fabric and potentially causing additional impact on the significance of the structure. Developing protocols and prototypes with the team and undertaking training for those doing the work will achieve consistent results of higher quality. Teamwork between the contractor and architects or engineers is important in agreeing the standards of work expected and developing mutual understanding and respect. Implementing the work comes next. And consistent with all conservation projects is the need to document the work through all its stages, recording the decisions, the testing results and the evaluations made and the rationales for what was undertaken and why throughout the project. Next. Lastly, periodic maintenance and monitoring of the risk factors affecting the concrete is essential to prolong the effectiveness of the repair work and to sustain the building. Maintenance may be a conservation action in its own right. Preventative work and care of repairs needs to be integrated into the maintenance plan for the building. A dedicated budget needs to be provided and roles and responsibilities of those responsible needs to also be clearly defined. Next. The five principles I briefly outlined, of course, include a number of more specific and detailed subheadings that attempt to provide a framework for good conservation practice. Concrete conservation is a complex and not yet well established practice. We encourage you to discover the principles introduced here in more detail in the document itself, which is downloadable from the GCI website. Next. My fellow author, Ana Paula Arata Gonsalves, and I would like to thank the many angels who contributed to the creation and publication of this document, including members of the ICOMOS ISC 20 Committee and the Docomomo ISC Techn Technology Committee, uh, and all the individuals listed here, along with our own GCI team. Next. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And our next speaker is Claudia Devo. Yes, hello. So I'm a heritage architect in Paris, and I want to this evening, uh, this today, uh, present you the implementation of cathodic protection at the Villa E1027, at Eileen, from, which was built from Eileen Gray and Jean Badouisi in between 1926 and 1929. So it's an iconic building and like you can see it's next to the seaside of the Mediterranean uh, Sea, next to Monaco and Italy. And um, this is the, the reason why there are a lot of problems of the concrete. It's very exposed to the elements. Um, it's built in out of two materials, essentially. Um, the structure of the pillars and the ceilings are out of concrete and the walls are of whole bricks. The Keeping It Modern grant we got for the restoration 
uh, permitted us to go very uh, intense, made very intense um, analysis and diagnosis. So next picture, please. We started in 2014-15. Next picture, please. Sorry. Yes, next picture. Um, we started in 2040, the uh, diagnosis. There was an other restoration done already in 2006, 2009, but cracks reappeared very quickly. So we started a new campaign again uh, to analyze the carbonation front, the position of the, the, the rate of chlorides and sulfates, um, the monitoring of the cor corrosion potential and uh, a lot of lot of other um, diagnoses and analyses, and you see on the picture here the main problem was that the balcony was um, not waterproofed and water was spread out in the whole ceiling and the pillars, and um, made that the that the concrete was a lot of carbonated um, and in a very bad condition. So next picture. We install next picture. We installed a, a weather station where we measured uh, the temperature, the relative humidity, and the corrosion uh, activity uh, during two years nearly. And next picture, please. And um, the so we found out that the concrete uh, sanitary conditions uh, was very very poor. Uh, the majority of steels were in a polluted environment with chlorides and carbonates and the corrosion of the steel was very active and very high. Um, so we tried to find a new concept of restoration. Uh, the restoration, there were not so much possibilities in this context, which were really the concrete very, very much polluted. So uh, the, the corrosion inhibitors were not efficient in this type of context. And there was not the possibility also to realkanization or extraction of chlorides. So the only type of intervention was uh, to do re traditional restoration, which means uh, purging the altered concrete and corroded steel, replacing the steel and filling in formulated concrete, or the cathodic protection. So we were quite interested in the cathodic protection because it was a very long uh, lasting restoration um, of 50 years normally and uh, even more uh, we don't know yet <laughs> it's not so long old and um, since the condition of the concrete was so poor it seemed as very interesting next please in in 2019 we installed a prototype for the cathodic protection um, with um, impressed current and you see there is the prototype. So it's very invasive anyway, because you have the, the anodes all 30 centimeters and you have to connect all the steel. Um, so that means that you make a lot of holes, a lot of trenches to, uh, to put in the, the cables. And the idea was that you don't see anything after intervention. Next, please. Here was a concept of the restoration. So the yellow part was where we decided to, to do um, cathodic protection. Also the pink one, the pillars and the beams and, uh, and uh, the blue one, we decided to do traditional uh, restoration to preserve more the original substance. And um, this was a part also which were less um, in, a, in a better condition. Next, please. Here you see the work which is going on and you can see the ceiling uh, where all the, the, which was not uh, there, uh, yeah, the, the concrete which fall down we perched. And then you see the anodes, normally the anodes are much bigger, but we had the ceiling which was only seven centimeters. And so we had very small anodes of 40, four centimeters. Uh, you see them all 30 centimeters and with the connected with the cables and you see the trenches also which uh, which uh, put all the steels together to connect them and to relay them to the uh, um, electrical installation next please 
here you see the work going on. So in the slab, we made, we put in 360 anodes. You have to know it's a little house. It's only 120 square meters. And this part is just really not very big. It's perhaps uh, 40 square meters or something like this. And it's really a lot of, a huge amount of, uh, of anodes. Next, please. And here you see the intervention in the beams. Um, and next, please. And uh, in the end, the columns with 100, 124 anodes. Um, next, please. In the end of this restoration program, we had to, uh, to repair the concrete uh, with a formulated um, concrete which had the same, uh, it was identical to the historical, so that it fits very well. And um, on the so you see the electrical installation of the cupboard. And there was a little, little cabin where we put in the electrical installation and all the cables were uh, arrived there. So in the end, you have the two pictures. You don't see any more any intervention. Um, of uh, the cables, they are all uh, put in in the concrete in the reparations. And uh, so this is uh, what is now finished. And we had the big chance that the building is whitewashed. So the, 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 you don't see any, anything anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Okay. And our next speaker is Paul Godet. Thank you, Ana Paolo. Um, before I begin, I, I, I would like to thank uh, you and Susan and the GCI's uh, team's efforts to develop the concrete conservation principles and congratulations um, on the launch. Uh, we had the opportunity to work on the North Shore Congregation Israel be um, starting in about 2016. Um, the complex was designed by Minoru Yamasaki, uh, built around 1964, and is located in, in Glencoe, Illinois, a suburb just north of Chicago, um, on the bluff um, overlooking um, Lake Michigan. Next. Our approach um, first started with project planning, and we followed um, basically, the similar the princi five principles laid out in the uh, concrete conservation principles. The first step was project planning, um, which included forming a project team and establishing goals. Uh, we were very fortunate in this case to have a client who desired a careful approach. Um, and also, uh, the contractors selected were, were skilled and had the appropriate uh, craftsmen to uh, with experience with historic concrete repair. Next. Our approach was first to assess uh, the significance, history, and original construction techniques, perform investigation and laboratory analysis of the materials, which is usually required for this type of work, uh, probably a little bit more than you would for normal concrete repair. Uh, follow the preservation standards, as um, Susan mentioned, and then develop options and design the repairs with the, with the primary goal of matching the original um, existing concrete. Next. So the investigation um, focused on the architectural precast concrete. Um, that's what we'll cover in this presentation. Um, the concrete itself was defined by uh, a white cement matrix with exposed quartz aggregate in um, some architectural curve projecting um, ribs. Uh, the distress conditions include cracking, corrosion of embedded reinforcing steel. Um, most of this had to do with a thin profile of concrete cover, um, which were the areas of the most significant um, repair work uh, that was needed. Uh, laboratory and testing and petrographic analysis um, was performed. And uh, once again, carbonation levels uh, had reached the level of the reinforcing steel, which was the primary driver of the deterioration. Next. So as far as the uh, investigation, we also found that areas um, of the double curved ribs were areas that, that seemed to produce more of the deterioration. And also 
there were different um, attempts at repair in the past, some of which were marginally successful, but some of them had um, continued to deteriorate and uh, delaminate it um, at corroded reinforcing steel. The investigation, um, we, our, the construction strategy or the conservation strategy we developed was to follow the preservation guidelines, uh, match original concrete with color profile and finish, um, but also include variability um, in the finish other repair areas to have it better uh, match and blend in with the existing concrete. Next. The first step was to perform cleaning samples um, in mock-ups on the, on the building to um, attain what color and appearance that we were, we were trying to achieve to match um, the design mix too. This had um, some soiling, some organic growth um, that was luckily easily removed through um, mild detergents and biocides. Next. <clears throat> and once the appearance was established, um, the next challenge was to design um, the concrete mixes and mortar mixes um, for the repair work. So some aggregate sourcing was performed. Um, many mock-ups were performed and, and then revised again, then revised again. Um, taking into account curing time, aggregate exposure, color changes, surface prep, all these things um, had to be um, developed prior to doing any work um, on the building. Next. Mm -hmm. Once that was achieved and successful um, mock-ups had been performed, the next step was to actually perform work on the building, the implement, implementation um, phase. This is a, a fairly straightforward repair with a rib and a column um, following good concrete repair practice um, that is used on most concrete structures. Um, but in this, you have to add the item of, of installing formwork and matching the existing concrete. Next slide. Um, the, the double reverse curves of the ribs were a little bit more challenging um, because of the shapes and the difficulty of access and placement. Um, because of the varying degrees of, of how you would place the formwork. Uh, but the basic techniques followed the same, um, chipping behind reinforcing bars, cleaning other uh, repair areas and, and others, other um, examples of good concrete practice. Next slide. This is where the um, craftsmanship levels really come into play is the um, creation of custom formwork um, that reflects lessons learned in the trial repairs. Uh, once again, you wanna really do a, a good job of vetting some of your techniques prior to working on the, on the building. And this is where a high level of craftsmanship um, really comes into play. It cannot be overstated. Um, the formwork, the timing of the formwork removal, blending of edges, and even how to place the concrete in the formwork are very challenging. Next. And once the formwork is removed is, in this case was to expose the paste, um, a retarder was used to weaken this, the near surface region to allow the contractor to remove the paste once the formwork was removed. Um, but you can see some of the challenges with uh, the formwork and matching the existing profile uh, in the image on the left. Next. And at the end of the project, um, obviously I've simplified this quite a bit, um, but at the end of the project, um, you can see how uh, the repairs blend very well um, and hit the next slide. And this, this shows where the repairs actually are. Um, this was very close after the um, repair project had completed. Um, and the right image uh, was three years later. And um, I think you can see that it's still blending um, fairly well. Um, we, there's been no other work at this time. And um, we will continue to monitor um, in the future, but the repairs seem to be performing fairly well. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And the next presenter is Rosa Lowinger. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Anna Paula and uh, Susan. It's a great pleasure to be here today, and I am really uh, um, 
gratified to be able to participate in an event to honor the book, Concrete Conservation Principles for Concrete of Cultural Significance. It's a great work. Um, I'm gonna be talking today about the Miami Marine Stadium, a building in Miami, Florida, a waterfront stadium that was the nation's purpose, first purpose-built grandstand to showcase the sport of speedboat racing. The building was built in 63. It was designed by a young Cuban American architect named Hilario Candela, who uh, worked for the firm of um, a, a, a Miami based firm. And the building's primary use from 1963 to when it was shuttered in 1992 was to be a grandstand for speedboat racing and also um, a performance venue. They had a, a floating stage in front of the building. Um, the problem with the building was though that the city of Miami was never really able to carefully monetize the, the building itself and they had a lot of problems running it so they were always looking for a reason to close the building and Hurricane Andrew a class five storm in 1992 gave them that excuse. They were hoping to be able to demolish the building and got some FEMA funding to do so but engineering studies performed at the time by SGH showed that the building was not significantly damaged by the storm. Next slide, please. And in part, it was because, um, next slide. In part, it was because the building was very well designed to begin with, no, 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 back, back to the other one, please. Um, in part, it was because the building was designed very well and included galvanized rebar in its cantilevered hyperbolic paraboloid roof line. So the building did have decay, but it wasn't damaged significantly by the storm. But that said, the city was eager to get rid of the building and they allowed it to just languish, um, to demolish by its own decay. And what happened in 1997, the street art community that was then burgeoning around the world and in South Florida discovered the building. Next slide, please. And over the course of the last uh, decades since that time, the building has been repeatedly covered with graffiti, with murals, with street art. It's an extremely popular, or it has been because the building's been closed since then, an extremely popular street art venue. It's internationally well known. It's photographed. There's literally tens of thousands of photographs on the internet of the street art of the Marine Stadium. In, 2000, in the early 2000s, a group joined together to create a, an organization called Friends of Miami Marine Stadium to see about conserving the building. Um, and uh, it included the original architect, Hilario Candela, who is pictured on the bottom right-hand side of the screen in his gray suit. Um, and the, go the goal was to conserve the building, but in Miami, they really didn't understand exactly what needed to be done. There was a lot of talk about sandblasting off all the graffiti that is some in some places 200 layers thick. And I got involved with Friends of Miami Marine Stadium and eventually we started to do some convincing of the city of what they needed to do to approach the conservation of this building. Uh, next slide, please. And luckily we were able to obtain one of the first Keeping It Modern grants from the Getty Foundation to deal with the issues, which are primarily the extensive layers of graffiti, um, cracking, spalling, and losses to the concrete, extreme corrosion of the rebar and other metal components in the building. And of course, the fact that the building sits in the water itself, so the piles are subject to extremes of salinity and uh, deterioration. Next slide, please. So our team for the first round of the testing under the Keeping It Modern um, uh, grant was uh, RLA Conservation, my firm with John Fiddler Preservation Technology and the engineers uh, Linton Ferraro, which are no longer in practice, but are practicing separately. And we um, developed primarily methodologies for dealing with the graffiti and doing testing of the concrete. The second phase of the work, which was done already when the city was already convinced that it needed to actually take action because the building garnered a huge amount of international attention, including from the National Trust for Historic Preservation and the World Monuments Fund. So the city finally and the state put funding into developing construction documents and that was done by RJ Heisenbottle Architects in conjunction with 
The original architect, Hilario Candela and WJE served as the engineers for that project. Um, and I would like to make sure to shout out Kelly Ciociola from our firm who led the project on both initiatives. Uh, next slide, please. So the first phase of the work involved, of course, doing all the testing um, to determine the concrete mixes, the uh, level of carbonation, um, the level of corrosion, but also one of the overwhelming requirements of this building that, that was unique to others is that it had had two distinct periods of use. The first was the period from 1963 to 1992 when it was this sports venue. And then there was the period from 1997 onward when it was known as an international graffiti venue. So not only did we have to determine whether you could remove the graffiti and how to do it safely, but we also had to create a series of charrettes with the community, the street art community, the preservation community to determine how we could remove this graffiti and, and guarantee that it would not go back to being that type of site. Um, we've lectured on this many times before. There's a lot published on that, so I'll continue. Next slide, please. So in the second phase of testing, we went through a series of uh, methodologies to determine ways to remove the graffiti safely from the different and to develop the concrete cleaning methods and to develop the concrete mix as well. Next slide, please. The graffiti removal was a fairly complex series of uh, of uh, steps that involved um, usually more than one um, type of methodology. In some cases, the thicker, the thicker accumulations were best removed with dry ice blasting, but then several different types of abrasive methods were found to be best for the graffiti that was embedded into the surface. And we were able to protect the formwork completely and the stucco finishes on the interior room walls. Next slide, please. And of course, we tested anti-graffiti coatings because you had this building that had been a well-known graffiti site for so many years that in order to protect those surfaces moving forward, even the, if the building was went back to being in use, there's still a lot of exposed surface. This building is not, is one of the, the characteristics of this building is that the interior and the exterior are one and the same. Next slide. And of course, the general soil removing um, and the organic growths was done with some of the traditional products that there was there, there is surprisingly a lot of expanse of, of uh, concrete that is not covered in graffiti as well. Next, please. And whenever we did any of the testing for cleaning or uh, application of coatings, for anti-graffiti removal, that's the only coatings for anti-graffiti, we did colorimeter tests to make sure that we were not altering the cleaned finish that we had achieved to begin with. Next. And then finally, and uh, significantly, but since Paul has gone into this so thoroughly, I won't go into the same, we did extensive tests to find the right mix for the concrete. And it's a very challenging thing as Paul has already mentioned and Susan as well, because um, you don't get what you get when you finish doing the, the testing. It takes a long time for it to cure and see whatever the, the type of finish you have. But we did achieve um, matches for all the areas that we were trying to um, match. Next slide, please. And so we have a series of general conclusions. Of course, the main one being that all of the, the, that the graffiti can be removed and it can be removed safely without damaging the concrete. There's no need to paint this building, which is one of the things that was entertained before we came on board. Uh, everything that needed to be used on this building has to, to take into account the importance of the aquatic basin. And the finally that everything that we did is going to have to be redone by a qualified contractor when they come on board to do the work. Thank you. Uh, hello. Well, um, thank you so much uh, to Rosa, Claudia, and Paul. Um, I hope it was helpful to see um, how all of these projects sort of followed a similar process of sound investigation and a knowledge-based approach um, to, to repair and conservation, which is really what the principles document is trying to do. Um, 
I have to say that we, um, we it wasn't attempting to be a detailed technical uh, guideline for concrete um, uh, because we felt that there was still a need to um, help provide a decision making process um, type of uh, document at the beginning of that and also acknowledging that there are some aspects of concrete repair that actually need for for conservation specifically that need more research before we're really able to provide um, huge amounts of, of new technical guideline guidance beyond what's already um, available. I also just wanted to mention that um, if you're interested in seeing more case studies of good concrete conservation, um, we have our book concrete case studies in conservation practice, where there are uh, 12 case studies um, that uh, illustrate a number of fantastic buildings and projects from different parts of the world um, uh, on this particular topic. Um, we just have some time for questions, uh, for some discussion amongst um, the presenters now. And um, meantime, if, if people have questions that they would like to put in the Q&A following the, the panel discussion, we will be um, taking those questions and asking our panelists to, uh, to respond to those. So I think we have all our panelists online again now. Um, and I just have a few questions for them. And the first one, uh, and some of them was, this is already covered in their, in their presentations, but I wanted to ask them what they thought the most difficult conservation challenge was that they faced in their particular project. And that might be a technical or an operational or something else. Um, and perhaps I could ask Claudia to respond to that question first. Yes, sure. Um... What was for us the most complicated issue was um, the uh, cathodic protection is very invasive. And uh, the idea of historical <coughs> restoration of historical monuments is to preserve the maximum of um, original uh, material and substance. Mm -hmm. So we had a conflict to one in the one time to make a long lasting repair solution, which is the cathodic protection. And on the other hand, uh, not to lose too much original substance. Well, if you look very, very long, it is good uh, because you preserve, you do it once and then you preserve the maximum and you don't have to intervene again. But it's anyway, it was a problem for us. And the other hand, on the other hand, also the cathodic protection means that you have a, a, a maintenance and an enterprise which is supervising the electrical installation uh, all the time. Once you install it, it mm -hmm. never ends. So uh, this is another problem. Uh, well, but for this type, it was for us the only possibility uh, to intervene. So in the end, we decided to do this, but it was a big discussion um, mm -hmm. if we really should to do the cathodic protection or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Claudia. Pa Paul, do you want to respond next? Yeah. Yeah, but usually um, I find the most difficult challenges uh, usually revolve around the project team. And, um, you know, oftentimes you have two of the three parties um, are experienced. Um, um, the example I showed you were all three parties I, I thought had a lot of experience, which makes life so much easier. But when you have um, different levels of experience or interests, um, and a lot of those revolve around cost, schedule, um, things of that nature. And, and it, sometimes it'll devolve down into, do we really have to do it this way? Um, and it makes it very difficult um, for the project team, but it's, it's the expectation management side is, is sometimes difficult. Um, certainly there's regional issues where um, some areas of the world tend to do more of this work or have embraced it more, whereas some are just starting out. And I think that that raises some challenges too. But, but once again, I think um, probably the biggest challenge of all in my, in my view is uh, to sometimes is the uh, craftsmanship level um, and, and the importance of that and doing the work. If they know how to do it, um, then it's just a choice. Um, if they don't know how to do it, then you're, you're really facing an uphill battle. Hey, thank you. Uh, Rosa, how about you? Which question? 
Oh, the first one. So for you, which was the most, um, what was the, um, the most difficult conservation challenge that you faced on your project? Well, first of all, this project's not actually <clears throat> yet. This was just, we just mm -hmm. did phase, but clearly the, the, by far and away, the most difficult was just the culture of preservation in Miami being a little bit difficult to navigate. The idea that there are a lot of, there's a, you know, very few people who have um, training and really mm -hmm. understand and what's possible. So there was a lot of, oh, that can't be done. Oh, that, that won't work. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really the architect himself who had, who believed in it. That's, that's the mm -hmm. only thing that really got us over the line. Huh. You mean the original architect of the building? The original oh. And he's, he was a great advocate of, mm -hmm. of all conservation efforts. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, my next question, um, I guess relates to some of the answers that you or follows from some of the responses that you had. I was interested to know how difficult or easy it perhaps it was to get your clients to adopt um, the very careful approach taken on these particular projects um, and include all the different stages of the work, the necessary testing and trials. And, and, and then the second part of that is how difficult is it to get that to happen on other projects that you've worked on, um, because these are all fairly very high profile for buildings. So, um, you know, so how hard was it for this one? And how hard is it um, on other projects that you've worked on? And, and Rosa, why don't you start um, with that one? Well, on this one, as I explained, on this one, it was mm -hmm. difficult. And, you know, and, and, and the jury has not come back yet on this <laughs> one. We don't, re the construction documents are being completed. We occasionally hear these crazy things that somebody has published somewhere that the uh, that the building's going to be totally painted, and we have to rush back and find out where that came from. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's it is it is significantly challenging. But I think I think with um, the other thing too is I think the scale of the building is also is is mm -hmm. making. So on smaller structures, and particularly in my work where I work on monuments a lot, I think it's it's not as difficult to get mm -hmm, mm -hmm. done. I think that the key problem with with concrete conservation, and particularly the repairs and the and the level of time is is the amount of time that you need mm -hmm. to make sure that your repairs match. Because what you what you get is not what it's going to be once it cures. So you have to give yourself enough time for things to cure. And typically uh, conservation projects don't have that luxury. Mm. Mm. Great, thank you. Claudia, do you want to jump in? Yeah, why not? Um, well, we, we had an extraordinary chance because we had a client who was um, in the beginning of the project, he um, put together a, a scientific committee so we had all the input of, uh, mm. of the scientific people and the architects, historians and everything. And so there was no discussion about to, uh, to do the maximum of the, the diagnosis. And uh, we, we tried really to analyze the maximum and to find the good uh, response to the, to the problematic we had. So it mm. was a very, very... Um, Great, what we could do and what we could uh, analyze, and there was no, no, uh, it was perfect. In other buildings, uh, which we are restoring with concrete, I always uh, insist that, and it's an obligation in France when it's an heritage building and um, something protected, a building which is protected, you have to do the the analysis of the concrete and mm -hmm. uh, so normally the the owner or the clients they understand that it's important and they do it so we uh, do mm -hmm. it uh, anyways not so much research a long time ago with the weather station and all this but we do mm -hmm. the normal analysis of the concrete every time mm -hmm. okay and, and Paul um, how about you um, you know, you talk a little bit about uh, how difficult it was for this particular project, but then I know you, know, you do a lot of work on all different types of buildings all around uh, the state. So Paul, could you perhaps 
um, comment on this as well? Yeah, I think um, the technical part, I, I agree with Claudia 100%. Mm -hmm. um, I think she brings up a good point about requiring a certain a higher level of assessment mm -hmm. in, in, in research in, in a more careful approach before you, you step forward with the repair work. Um, and also um, um, some of Rosa's comments related to the players or the team. And I think um, the use comes in into play also um, that can create challenges, especially if it's a reuse or um, the use may change or there's a question about how much use will something um, get that may have been very popular in the, in the 20s, but today doesn't have the same use. And sometimes the use is what drives it. For instance, if it's a, a stadium of some kind that's heavily used, um, the majority of the years there's plenty of, of funds and it has a high value. Um, sometimes it's, it's um, it may be less of a challenge to convince um, the stakeholders to spend the money, but in some examples where it's not highly used anymore, or there's, um, it hasn't been, you know, the concepts haven't been worked out on how to move forward, the financial mm -hmm. resources can be much more limited. Um, mm -hmm. But what's good is, as more documents come out and more approach, uh, the approaches get firmed up is there's more acceptance to these methods moving forward. Um, mm -hmm. And I think like Rosa said too, is I think there is a, I don't know how to do that or it can't be done and changing people's minds to say, oh yes, it can. And here's some examples. Um, I think there's mm -hmm. a, a little bit of a learning curve on that. Um, but also the hardest part is there's more, it, it's more expensive to do it correctly um, than not. Mm -hmm. Yep, I have to do it once usually. <laughs> Yeah. And is that because it, I mean, for, for Claudia, you know, because of their strong legislative approach and, you know, if they have got a historic monument, it is mandated that they have to do a certain level of investigative work and it's fairly well scrutinized by the heritage authorities. I mean, we don't have um, that sort of technical oversight in the same way necessarily in some of the buildings in the state. So it's more about, therefore, convincing your clients that this is a worthwhile process. Is is that right and helping them see the benefit of um a rigorous approach uh, sure <clears throat> when when they mm -hmm. have uh, the, I, I i answer the mm -hmm. client um has to be convinced but he understands and it's an obligation so he he is uh, he accepted uh, yeah. so sometimes what we do is to um, make only the necessary um analyzes and not to go uh, too far to to limit the, the expense but it's mm -hmm. also um the the, the french um, state is uh, does gives subventions for this kind of work so uh, mm -hmm. i speak only for the her cultural heritage huh, which is protected the buildings which are protected so mm -hmm. you uh, it's the, the the state and the the ministry asks that you do these investigations but they also they help to to uh, pay them mm. so mm. it's accepted mm. and it's necessary mm. so in the states for paul and rosa um do you think it's getting easier as more people start to recognize the importance of conservation have you seen a shift in people's willingness to invest in in uh this more, um, you know, not diagnostic, the, the necessary diagnostics and um, careful trials and things in the States over the last few years, uh, as concrete has become more widely recognized as important mater building material, Paul and, and Rosa? Yeah, yeah I mm -hmm. do. Um, and I think, I think the stewardship of some of these properties has become more serious. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think it goes beyond concrete um, to more just the 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 arena of conservation in general, but it's mm -hmm. it's kind of working itself over to concrete. Um, you know, it's, it's more of the later developed uh, technology compared to masonry or stone or other things, but um, it certainly has become uh, more recognized. And I and I can see that in some of the technical organizations I belong to, there is a mm. more awareness to it. Mm -hmm. um, than there used to be. 
um, I think as in the U.S. as, as things begin to age. Um, and, in, and I think that holds true in some other countries too around the world. Um, the same holds true, but I think the recognition um, has really helped um, mm -hmm. with regards to the acceptance of restoration of some of these. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Um, uh, my last uh, question was really um, based on your experiences, what you think the most important factor or ingredient is to getting good uh, concrete conservation and and why you would you would say that's the most important ingredient or factor Paul you're on my screen so why don't you go first <laughs> okay I, I know you, you and I have talked a lot about this but I think by far um, in, in, insurmountable um, issue with with concrete repair is crafts, craftsmanship mm -hmm. and um, no amount of um, drawings and specifications and reports is can replace good craftsmanship um, and I think it's it's uh, from the contractor side the craftsmanship side um, experience that that's that's the most important component um, that I find mm -hmm. challenging and certainly they're getting there's more now than there used to be mm -hmm. um, but that's usually a repetitive skill that's developed and that's the high end of concrete work um, mm -hmm. and you'll see a lot of it um, transfer over from masonry, like a person will be doing masonry repair work one day and then concrete repair the other, the next, and, mm -hmm. and really it needs to be experience in historic concrete repair work. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, uh, Rosa? Um, I, I echo what Paul mm -hmm. said. I think, I think it's getting easier. I definitely think it's getting easier to to get this kind of support for this type of work. Um, I think because it's just um, the, the critical information is getting, it's trickling down to places where they might not be centers of preservation and people are really um, starting to understand also from a, from a financial standpoint that they are really gonna have, to, if they don't do it right the first time, they're gonna have to do it again. And that's the last mm -hmm. thing they wanted. Sometimes you just have to scare them into that idea. Um, <laughs> right. By the way, Susan, I've noticed that there's been a ton of questions about yeah. you didn't preserve the graffiti, and I wonder if I can answer that. Yeah, well, what, should we wait until we could do the open question session to do that? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to, I think we'll finish a few minutes early so we can get to the, all the questions. So, Claudia, do, do you want to um, jump in on your most, um, what you think is the most important factor? I, I agree also completely with mm. Paul because uh, in the end, that's what you see and what uh, the craftsman mm. is, is doing. And um, it's very important that there, even if it's concrete and all that, there is a lot of um, finesse. It's mm. has been done very, very uh, accurately. And um, that's uh, very much of patience and uh, the, it's very important. Mm. Okay, well, um, given that we do have quite a lot of questions, I think we might give our last two minutes over to the open question session. Um, Anna Paula, if you're if you're ready to take over uh, from that, because um, yes, we do have a lot of questions. So I'm going to hand over to Anna Paula. Thanks, Susan. Yes, we do have a lot of questions, so we'll get to as many as we we can given the time, the limit, our limited time. But um, unfortunately, I don't think we'll be able to get to all of them. Maybe we can get started with the one Rosa was already starting to address. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have been asking about the significance of the graffiti layers. And I know, Rosa, you had a huge de uh, debate about how to address that on your project. That was a major part of our project. Um, there's a couple. There's a couple of things. One, the first thing is preserving graffiti is different than preserving other things because it makes no sense to say I'm arbitrarily going to choose this layer on this day and call it because that's not how it works. The artists who produce that work preserve their work on in photography and generally that is. Um, 
disseminated over the internet. The, art, the artists are not expecting that work to, to be there for more than a couple of days because usually someone tags on top of it. So that traditional idea of preservation doesn't work for graffiti that is not curated murals, which is a different story and not what we have here. A couple of other things. The architect was all on board. Hilario, 80 years old, was totally on board with leaving the graffiti on the surface. The problem is the other stakeholders weren't so much and our charrettes with the graffiti community were very positive. They said, look, if you're gonna take care of the building, we will lay off. But if you're not gonna take care of the building, if you're gonna let it deteriorate, it's ours. So it was a kind of great balance and there's still mm -hmm. in the work some idea of allowing certain aspects of the building to be uh, graffiti. Like Hilaria would like to have the ramps available, but I, it's not clear whether that's gonna happen. And um, that, but 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 a lot of thought has been given to this, and I think it would be great. There's so many images available. Um, you could literally, and you, there's so many wall expanses. You could literally project it onto the surfaces. Thank you, Rosa. And somewhat related to that, and this is addressed. Uh, it wasn't addressed to a particular uh, speaker, so maybe. Uh, Anybody who has an opinion can jump in. John Allen asks, um, the principles don't say much about patina, which is a particularly difficult issue in historic concrete repair, as almost all remedial procedures necessarily start with cleaning or removal of previous deleterious, deleterious coatings. Any comments? I, I had one, this is Paul. Um, I think that's a very good point. Um, and I know I glossed over it a little bit, but um, it's very challenging to decide, it, well, to make sure you don't overclean. And, and the object is not to make it new, um, but just to decide on what level of clean you want. And, and one of the dangers that happens very quickly is it's hard for the new concrete to age as quickly as the original concrete. Is the original concrete, um, will tend to soil or develop um, biological growth, it's, it seems more quickly, and it's hard to match those. Um, so I've always tried to side more with a little bit more patina um, or a little bit, um, you know, cleaning a little bit less than a little bit more. Um, and maybe Rosa has more insight on that, but that's, that's the way I've, I've usually done it. I, I would agree. I would agree less is more. Um, obviously, when you're removing layers of graffiti, you get to a cleaner surface than you would on some of the other areas. And I think that's definitely going to come up when the building's actually worked on. That's why, as we all agree, that it's so important on a project like this to have conservation oversight to be able to manage those ideas. And, and Anna Paula, I would just say that um, uh, yeah, it's true. We didn't cover um, specific um, technical issues like cleaning in this document. But I mean, I think it's a little bit like cleaning that we have for stone buildings as well. You know, the first question is, um, is what is the, the soiling? Is the soiling causing damage to or contributing to some of the technical problems? You know, is there a sooty layer that is putting particular salts into the building, which might mean you want to clean um, or you might need to clean? Um, do Is the soiling or the patina contributing to significance? So it's important and you might want to preserve it. Um, do you have challenges related to uh, the extent of work and how do you match in new work with existing work if you've got previous coatings and patina. So there's a whole sort of process that I think we we kind of go through when we're dealing with historic buildings about cleaning. And I think they equally um, apply uh, to concrete actually. Um, and, um, you know, I think um, we probably could do with some better guidance on this, um, specifically for concrete, because as we know, and I think as raised in this question, you know, a lot of concrete buildings have had uh, coatings put on them in the past, and um, and that can be problematic in in itself, depending on what they are. Um, so there's a whole lot of different reasons that I think is quite building specific about the process that you go through to decide. Um, what you have to do for removal of previous coatings or not, um, uh, and patina being important or not, creating 
contributing to deterioration or not and things like that so um it's a it's a it's not a necessarily as a simple um a simple question and and as the as the question raises it can be quite a complex issue one thing i would like to bring up um uh, Ana Paolo can't see it behind her because it's her background, but I think her background um, is kind of a perfect example of the question, um, is how do you match that much variability in a surface? Um, you know, and I always consider that part of the patina too, is when you repair it, your tendency would be to choose one type of surface within that whole cluster of surfaces um, to match to, but uh, along with the patina of the surface, you have to also match the variability, which actually can sometimes be even more difficult. Otherwise, it'll stand out. And can I raise a, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to raise a possibly rather crude point for such a um, distinguished and expert gathering, but that is um, public response to concrete, uh, where the difficulty of getting people to accept the validity of repairing and looking after buildings from the exposed concrete period of 20th century architecture is already quite substantial. And for me, I love the patination of these buildings over time. I find the dirt uh, has a beauty to it that um, they weather in a way that I find attractive and interesting. But if cleaning them to our taste excessively is a major part of uh, helping people to see them in a new light without having to have terrible new landscaping schemes or terrible planting schemes or other bad interventions. Uh, to me, that might be a sacrifice worth making. That's a good point. And just uh, to keep on that subject of um, w what are some arguments one can use to convince uh, different stakeholders. Maybe it's not just the, the owners to um, act of the importance of conserving uh, this type of heritage. Well, one, it, I, th I think it depends where you are. So for example, in places where you have, where concrete buildings, like I would say, um, Latin America or Miami or LA, for example, places where you where a, where these where that period was so significant in the his, in the history of the area. I think I think that that is actually useful. So, for example, with the Marine Stadium, the fact that it was built at a moment when the city was changing and it sort of was a harbinger of the Cuban American influx into the city and it's becoming a world class center really made a difference to, to just try to sort of situate it. Yes, in South Florida, you don't have 18th century buildings. So you situate the history of the location into those buildings. It helps. Because these that period of architecture has become a lot more popular with a lot of younger people, um, that can be a useful tool to bring that the awareness of uh, managements who are older and haven't caught up with it. Uh, so you can embarrass them with that on occasion. Uh, I think you can also usefully um, bring in expert voices because just hearing somebody calmly and sensibly explaining why these buildings are so good uh, is sometimes the first time people have come across some of these arguments. And I think it's uh, always worth doing. And if it's a good building, there'll be someone within reach who's happy to come and make that case in a strong sort of way. Uh, it can be difficult, though, undoubtedly. Um, but I think it's improving steadily with the slight caveat that in this country, certainly in the UK, where I'm speaking from, it's subject to the same kind of um, nightmarish right-left culture war that so much else is becoming subject to, uh, where by and large, our current um, government is uh, actively hostile to modernist architecture. And it brings in policies explicitly aimed at the demolition, the mass demolition of 1950s to 70s architecture without having to have planning approval, um, which is uh, both culturally and environmentally very, very strange as a policy. And, 
And Anna Paula, if I could just say that I think, you know, advocacy is always the first stage. And then um, uh, I, I just could maybe give a plug for the piece of work that we've been doing um, on the 20th century historic framework, which is a piece of work which is trying to demonstrate um, the historic themes of the 20th century that were important around the world and to help people use um, to, pro to provide a tool for decision makers and, and governments and others interested in, in heritage to start to build um, advocacy for and inventories for, for, his, for 20th century places in different parts of the world because we've got to care for them first and, and then we can protect them and then we can have more opportunities to bring good, good conservation to, to bear on them. So that's a piece of work that um, we're in the process of finishing and will be available uh, next year. But I think there's some really good um, materials out there right now that really promote the importance of and, and celebrate the importance of, of these buildings. You know, Barnes's book being a good example of that, but increasingly uh, exhibitions and, you know, fantastic uh, text and really nice pieces of advocacy work that is being done in different parts of the world dedicated to sort of protecting these types of, of buildings quite specifically that are good places to to refer to 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 try and help make your make your arguments um claudia we've been getting a lot of questions about uh the durability of the cathodic protection system that uh, it's being implemented at Villa E1027. Could you uh, talk a little bit more about it and how long do you expect it to last? Um, what, what I said, it's uh, normally, well, it does not exist so, so long, but they say that could, it could stay uh, 50 years or something, so which is uh, really enormous because a traditional reparation uh, restoration is 10 to 20 years, but, rather 10 years, uh, even if you do it in a good way and properly. So um, if it really it takes 50 years, it would be great. But how I said also, you have permanently um, supervised the electrical installation and, um, and make sure that uh, the current which is in, in impressed is, is the, the good level and it's, everything is, is working very well. But normally uh, the anodes are of titanum, so it's a, a system which is very, very um, long lasting. Should be very long lasting. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I have a, a question from uh, Peter uh, Mayer. Uh, um, about concrete mixes uh, that have been used in the in the various uh, case studies mentioned here, were all the concrete mixes uh, design custom custom designed, or were any of them off the shelf uh, products that have been modified to match? I can mention um, the when I was working on it was all custom. Um, there are some manufacturers of some. Uh, some color matched mixes, um, but they really don't usually take into place the aggregate. Um, but even those would require some custom um, design. <laughs> and a lot of times the design itself isn't really um, where all the color comes from, especially if you have exposed aggregate or some types of, of finish can modify the appearance of the surface. For instance, once again, the example behind you, Anna, um, is you, if, if all those honeycombed areas or defects weren't there, it would look much brighter. Um, so a lot of things come in, into play and it all goes into the uh, mixed design. Um, it's, it's, it's more complicated than off the shelf. I would agree. And I would even venture to say that when we are doing repairs on concrete works of art, and using con uh, custom mixes because they're smaller typically. So um, it tends to make more sense. Even then we have to customize the, the proprietary mixes.
And uh, Claudia, on uh, Villa 1027, you also had the challenge of uh, having the patches on, uh, in, on underneath this lab. Uh, so how did you uh, modify or how, how did you solve that uh, challenge? Perch the, the concrete, which was not adherent, which fell down. And we, um, we put off the, the steels. We uh, took off all the concrete around the steels with two centimeters. And then we, we made the formulated um, uh, concrete which was the most similar to the existing and uh, the historical and we uh, take it together and we try to uh, to redesign the the wood uh, the wood structure which uh, served for the um, for the historical concrete so you have the lines which are continuing but this was all this craftsmanship that we told about it talked about it which is very important to have the final good um, with the design of the slab. Um, and Renee Riley uh, asked, um, how widely available are skilled contractors in concrete conservation? Um, maybe I'll answer that. I think uh, sometimes the pool of craftsmen depends on the environment, the, the regional environment. Um, if it's an area that doesn't go through a lot of cycles of, of um, weather that causes deterioration, um, you won't have as many people who work in it. So in many cases, it depends on the inventory and the um, environment of the concrete. Um, however, in, is, as time moves forward, there are more and more craftsmen in those areas. Um, and on rare occasion, um, we've brought craftsmen from one area to another um, because the, the level of skill just wasn't there. And there was like a, a small training um, that was done, which seemed to help. But um, it seems as though it is, as uh, Rosa said, it is, it is kind of um, spreading out that the, the uh, skill levels and the technology, things are, things are improving everywhere. And some of it, you know, uh, what I what um, I find is some of it is about developing relationships because initially, when you start to work with a contractor, say as a conservator, um, there's a lot of skepticism about what we can and can't achieve because you know you look at, for example, to go back to the wall behind Ana Paula again, a, a contractor would look at that and just go how you do that. But if it's about developing relationships and when you show them, you can do it once and the second time it's easier. So it's really the first time that you find a contractor to work with that it's typically hardest. How about in, in uh, your part of the world, Claudia? The, do you find it easy to find contractors to work on projects such as the E1027? Um, it's, uh, it's just very specialized um, enterprises. So there are not so many. And uh, it's, uh, no, it's not easy. It's not easy um, because uh, it's very, very specialized. And um, so we have some enterprises in France, um, but uh, not so many. So um, it's, uh, it's very important to, to choose uh, the good one. Thank you. And maybe we have time for one last uh, question. Um, Luisa Marao asked uh, the procedi procedimentments with um, the, the process with exams and the chemical characterization of concrete, is it also appropriate for art uh, made of concrete, such as sculptures? Yes. Yes, and, and um, absolutely. It's the same, you, you do the same thing. 
with with sculptures made of concrete. And of course, it, def it depends on the scale, because if you have a small indoor, if you have a small interior sculpture, you have a little bit more room to finesse with other non-concrete materials. But if you're looking at an outdoor piece that is going to be subject to the same type of stresses as a building, then you have to go with the same approach. And I agree with Rosa. I think um, sculptures even need more, um, by more sophisticated um, laboratory analysis, other materials, because sometimes sculptors won't be used to using that media and they may do things that a concrete finisher wouldn't do. In other words, they'll be molding it, adding water, sculpting it, cutting it with a trowel, doing all kinds of different things um, that wouldn't normally be done. And uh, there's a there's some good examples of that one in Calgary um, where there was several lions on a bridge that were uh, taken down um, and eventually repaired. Uh, Lauren Simpson um, from that area wrote a very good article on it. Um, and as Rosa just described, one of them that was restored was le left outside, but it was covered. And that provided the, uh, the durability that was needed. But I think sometimes it can actually be more complicated um, because of the unique features and details and things like that. And also typically artists that work in concrete are after a very specific aesthetic. You know, like Donald Judd works in concrete. Those are really specific aesthetics that these artists want and they are not negotiable. Any last minute uh, comments anybody would like to make before I close? Um, Anna Paula, I was just going to say there are a lot of questions um, about uh, some references and things like that. And um, I think there are some good um, things available. If you go onto our website, to our concrete conservation page, we do have an annotated bibliography that's got a lot of references to some of the articles and some other articles that people on the panel and um, and actually in our audience um, have written uh, that have really good case studies or good technical information as well. So take a look at that bibliography for those of you that aren't familiar with it, that might be a good place to find more information as well. Is there a possibility of answering some of these questions later? Do you, are you able to capture the questions? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> we'll ask our technical team to see if we can if we can do that. Um, yeah, because there's just way too many for us to to address, <laughs> unfortunately. But they're really great. Um, so I would just like to close by saying a big thank you to all of our speakers and our audience for joining us today. Uh, and a special thanks to our Getty support team who has been working backstage very hard to make this event run so smoothly. Thank you to Candace, Kim, Nestor, Marvin, Bill, Chris, and Andrea. Um, this event was organized as part of the GCI's Concrete Conservation Project, as Susan mentioned, that is, and that's part of the Conserving Modern Architecture Initiative. So if you're interested in learning more about concrete conservation, please take a look at our projects page on the GCI's website, and from there you can download the Conservation Principles for Concrete of Cultural Significance for free, and as long as, and uh, all, all the other uh, publications that we have available. Uh, so please join us again soon. I hope we, we do this uh, in a short time again. So thanks for being with us today. Bye. Mm -hmm.